Hello and welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We'll be starting uh, our webinar in a few minutes. Uh, I hope that despite the COVID situation, you're all safe wherever you are on the globe. My name is Catherine Simondi. I'm in charge of marketing and communication at ID Quantic, and I'm based in Geneva in Switzerland. Uh, this webinar is part of a series we started a few months ago. It'll be recorded and it can be rewatched anytime on our website. You just type www.idquantic.com slash webinars or you go to our news and events section and uh, please don't hesitate to forward this webinar to our colleagues, to your colleagues. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end of this webinar, which will be handled by uh, Mark Nicholas, who is leading the quantum sensing division at ID Quantic. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to use the question box, which is on the platform of GoToWebinar. Okay, so our webinar is today is entitled Enhancing Quantum Communication and Computing, Fluorescence Measurements, LiDAR and IC Inspection with Single Photon Detection. Uh, with me today, we have Félix Bussière. Hello, Félix. Hi, Catherine. Uh, Félix is VP Research and Technology at ID Quantic. He obtained his PhD in Physics uh, from the University of Montreal. He then worked as a senior researcher at the University of Geneva, where he led research in quantum technologies. Uh, Felix and his team are responsible for the development of IDQ's core technologies and for key innovative projects related to the development of single photon detectors, quantum random number generators, and quantum key distribution. So let's start. Uh, Felix, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, Catherine. So, hi everyone, uh, I'm Felix. Uh, I'm happy to be here with you and, and I'm really happy that you are spending some time with us uh, today. So let me just start right away uh, into the presentation. Uh, and I will start by uh, essentially talk, tell you what we wanna do in, in the quantum sensing business unit at IDQ, uh, where uh, we're very uh, uh, passionate about science, uh, anything that uses single photon, single photons. And then what we want to do is really to, uh, in a way, be part of your team uh, and empower, your, empower you researchers and industries in advancing the frontiers of single photon science and applications. And, and this is really about uh, what this webinar is uh, today. So, uh, so why do we want to go to single photon uh, uh, detection? Okay, there's, a, there's many reasons. Maybe I, I get into the whys, and hopefully in this presentation, this will become uh, properly illustrated. Sometimes we need to go beyond the classical limits of uh, conventional techniques. Like quantum key distribution, uh, optical quantum computing are uh, examples of that. Sometimes we need the highest sensitivity. We need to really go to the signals that are only at the single photon level to see something. In some situations, uh, faster measurements are actually possible because of single photons or uh, better spatial and time resolution thanks to the very good uh, time resolution of uh, SNSPDs among other things. Uh, sometimes we can play tricks with uh, correlations uh, and to get an improved SNR and see through things. I'll give an example of that. And uh, sometimes we have to be operating at a very low level so that it's eye safe and therefore the signals are at the single photon level. So how do we achieve this? Well, we can use single photon detection techniques, time resolved uh, photon detection and counting, and photon correlation measurements. So at IDQ, we uh, fabricate hardware and software that goes with it. Uh, we uh, have SPADs, so based on semi single photon detectors based on uh, uh, semiconductor uh, avalanche diodes. We also make SNSPDs, uh, and we make precision and timing electronics, and we combine these to uh, allow you to uh, find solutions to your problems in many different fields. Uh, one is very well known that, 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 and that has been at the core of our business for uh, 20 years now, quantum physics, and there's free space optical communication, life science, material science, uh, OTDR, LIDAR, security surveillance, uh, gas sensing, that are also applications that benefit from uh, the devices that we make and that benefit from 
uh, uh, working at the single photon level. So in a nutshell, uh, single photon avalanche detectors based on semiconductors are uh, APDs that we bias below the break, well, I'm gonna call it above the breakdown voltage. So we go from here to here in this IV curve here, and there we uh, have the ability to uh, trigger a macroscopic avalanche whenever one photon is absorbed. So we go from this region A to this point B, which creates a large current, uh, uh, almost an infinite gain limited only by the resistance, resistance of the junction. And uh, in the conventional way, in the gated mode uh, of operating a SPAD, what we do is we, we go from here to here by applying a gate. So we bring this voltage there. If there's a, well, and then we bring it down. If there's, if there's a detection, this creates a large current. And then we bring it back down to this point here and uh, we can have the detection of a single photon. So this operation mode is called synchronous. We need to know when the photon uh, should be arriving. And this is when we apply the gate. Uh, this can be done with our detector that is called the ID cube, our newest single photon detector. It has all the gating electronics inside, but we trigger it from the outside using the time controller, which can generate a gate. And whenever there's a detection, a logical pulse is gonna come out and we can register it with the time controller which, and then we can have uh, four detections here, for instance, and do correlations with the software suite that comes with the time controller. Uh, the cube also comes in, uh, the, the, in the ability to, in, in a format that allows it to work in an asynchronous fashion. So instead of applying a gate, we have a circuit that essentially places the voltage here. And whenever there is a detection, a large current is created that, uh, is sensed by the circuitry behind the diode, and that will uh, bring the voltage back to this point here to quench the avalanche. And after a certain dead time, we'll bring it back to this point here, ready to have another detection. And this mode does not require to know when the photon actually comes in, so it can be operating in so-called free running mode, so asynchronous application. In this case, we don't need to trigger it. We only need to register the detection using the time controller. So the cube is not our only uh, single photon detector. We have other ones. Uh, this one is really, uh, the ID230 is really targeting low noise detectors. Here, this is invisible high efficiency. Here it's super low jitter in the visible region as well. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about these in details, but please feel free to contact us to get more information about these kind of detectors. Here. Now I do wanna spend a bit more time talking about SNSPD, superconducting nanowire single photon detectors. Um, so let me start by the operation principle. So what we do here is we have uh, a, we fabricate a device that uh, is essentially a nanowire or maybe uh, more appropriately, uh, more uh, properly called a, a nano strip, something that is about a few nanometers thick and about a hundred nanometers wide. We cool this down to below its critical temperature. And then we apply a bias current that is below the critical current. And whenever a photon comes in, this will break about a thousand Cooper pairs. And then the interaction between this region of weakened superconductivity with the current will create a hotspot that is resistive. So the resistance of this goes from zero to about one kilo ohm in about 100 picoseconds. So really specific, uh, it's, it's hard to get that effect with anything else. And that's very uh, specific to the SNSPDs. And we put this into the shape of a meander like this. So whenever we get this and we put this into a biasing circuit like this one, where the current initially goes into the device, which can be modeled as an, a kinetic inductance in series with a switchable resistor, so either superconducting or resistive. Well, when we do have this detection, this switch uh, goes from this uh, zero resistance branch to this one here. And then the current is going to leave that to go into a, a, an amplifier. Uh, that will create an output pulse with a very sharp rising edge, which is associated with a very sharp uh, transition from superconducting to resistive here. And then the current leaves that branch, it cools down, and then the current can actually go flow back into the device here, which gives rise to a uh, falling edge that looks like that. So the, the, all of this is completely passive. Uh, so it means it's async, it's free running. It can work in any asynchronous application. We don't need to know when the photon comes in uh, and, and it's all passive. Um, so 
we make our own detectors at, uh, at IDQ. They're all made here in Switzerland. Uh, and as I was saying, a meander looks like this. This is the area over which we place an optical fiber that makes this ready to receive a photon for detection. So what do you get with SNSPDs? You get the best overall performance that uh, are possible with a single photon detector. So free running operation combined with very high efficiency up to 95% or even more, very low noise uh, from one to 100 counts per second, wave independent, also jitter, few tens of picoseconds, also a bit wave independent here, and then very short recovery times so that we can get detection rates in the tens of megahertz. Uh, we put the detectors in this cryo stack here. About here, we have cryogenic amplifiers at 40 Kelvin to uh, help with the noise uh, and improve the jitter of the detectors. And also, uh, the detectors are here, fiber coupled. They're cooled down to 0 0.8 Kelvin. Uh, there's an upside with SNSPDs, which is broadband detection efficiency. So we can get high efficiency over hundreds of nanometers. I'll show an example of that. Uh, we can have lots of detectors, up to 16s in this, in this system here, which can, in some situations, become a, the cost-effective solution if you need a lot of detectors. We, uh, with our cryogenic uh, electronics here, we get a true latch-free operation. There's no latching ever. I'm not going to explain this in details, but if you have a question, I'll be happy to explain it. Uh, and then we also get can get photon number resolution. I'll show that in another slide. So some specs at 1550, we have very high efficiency. This is an example here where we obtain 95% efficiency. So what you see is that this, this SDE system detection efficiency is activated by a bias current. Here, I'm just running a voltage, but it's a bias current. So we activate this efficiency there. We also have the dark count rate increasing a bit. And we have this plateau here, just before the critical current that is about uh, this region here, the critical uh, bias voltage. Um, the efficiency is in the range of 80 to 95% system efficiency for the optimal polarization. Dark count rates at 1550 are, uh, can be as low as 10 hertz, uh, typically below 100 counts per second. Uh, and this is black body photon dominated. The specs are very similar at 1310 because these devices are very broadband. Uh, similar specs at 1064 here, another example, 96% SDE. Um, we again are can have uh, uh, operating uh, in this range 80 to 95 percent. Here we have less uh, dark counts, less than 10 counts per second uh, in this uh, spectral region, and we have very similar specs at 780 to, to 95 nanometers. But here we can actually reach even lower dark count rates, uh, one count per second or even less. So they're broadband, as I was saying. Here we have examples of three detectors optimized for different wavelengths. This one is optimized for the, the 1310 to 50, 1550 region, which have a slow roll off of the efficiency towards that part here, and also another roll off here. So do these detectors detect beyond 1550? The answer is, is yes, indeed. So contact us if you're interested in this region. We'll be happy to discuss this further with you. Another example here with a very high efficiency at 1064, and you see it's really broad oh, from 850 to 1310. So really, really uh, broadband detectors. Same thing here with something with a maximum at around 850, also high efficiency over a large range. Um, so if, you know, an, an example where uh, somebody needs to do single photon spectroscopy over a long range, a large range of wavelength, you can actually combine several uh, detectors all together to get uh, high efficiency over a broad range. Okay, so photon number resolution, I was mentioning this. So there's a device that we're making at, at IDQ, which is made by having a couple of different pixels here that are connected in parallel. We've managed to make this work in a way that doesn't have latching at all. And uh, here, if you put eight, the eight, eight pixels like this, you could have one or eight pixels clicking. Here I'm showing the output pulse of one section clicking, one pixel clicking, two pixels clicking, three and four. And you see that they're very uh, easily distinguishable. So by placing, the, placing a threshold for a discriminator at, discriminator at the right place, it's possible to know which of these possibilities occurred. We make them with an efficiency at 70%, but we're working towards making this reaching 90% or more. Uh, it also provides faster detection. I'll be talking about that later. And the dark count rate is unchanged for these. 
Here's an example where we look at the distribution of the amplitudes for an eight pixel PNR detector. You see that the different pixels uh, really barely overlap. So these devices are really excellent at distinguishing the number of, of photons. They're up to eight photons. You see that little peak there is what we see. Okay, so let me move on a bit more into the applications. And again, I'm putting uh, why, why we do this. We want to empower researchers and industries in advancing this frontiers of single photon science and application. And let's now try to, let me now try to illustrate that with uh, a couple of applications. First one is QKD. So we want to push the limits and, and one of the limits of QKD is the, the distance. Uh, so an experiment that was done in 2018 at the University of Geneva was using the ID281 technology. And the goal there was really to uh, reduce the dark count rate of uh, detectors at 15, 15 nanometers in order to be able to detect the, the very few photons that actually make it all the way uh, through this 420 kilometers of optical fibers. So the goal was to take a detector with a good efficiency, a good, a very low dark count rate, and then apply extra filtering in order to get rid of the uh, black body photons that are still there and that are creating the residual dark counts that you see there. And then by doing this, obtaining an efficiency of 60% with one tenth of an earth of dark count rate and putting this uh, at the end of this QKD system clock at 2.5 gigahertz. And by doing this, it was possible to generate uh, a key uh, with QKD over this distance. And, and uh, at the time it was actually beating the previous rec record by three orders of magnitude. So really pushing the limits using SNSPDs is an example of what this technology uh, can do. Uh, so a, a second um, experiment of that, uh, or a second limit to push was the, the rate of QKD, uh, re, you know, going towards more than 10 megabits per second. And this was obtained by essentially changing the detectors here. So what was put there was these uh, PNR SNSPDs. It turns out that because they're PNR, if one section clicks, then you still have the other sections that are available for a further detection. So in a way you can reduce the, dark, the dead time of these detectors tremendously and increase the rate at which they can detect. So this was, this was used here and not two detectors, but actually four. And by using these over 50 kilometers of optical fiber, a secret key rate of 8.7 megabit per second was obtained and over 4 dB of attenuation, so very, a, a short distance. Uh, more than 10 megabits per second. So again, using the ability to evolve uh, these detectors here in this context allowed to uh, really increase the significantly uh, the rate at which QKD can be done. Okay, here's another experiment that was done at the University of Geneva using the ID281 technology. So the, the experiment there was exploring the um, the uh, possibility of generating photon pairs, entangled photon pairs from a silicon nitride microring resonator. So it's a really nice source of entanglement. Uh, it can be integrated. So in order to generate photons from this, you need to do spontaneous forward mixing because it's a chitri material. So the first thing to do is to uh, have a pump there that can be triggered from the time controller, for instance. So the pump goes in here and then a pair of photons is generated, which can be analyzed here using the detections using the ID281 technology and the, the analysis uh, and the discrimination feature and analysis and coincidence analysis feature of the time controller. And in order to get some nice results there, you need to have good specs for uh, this detector here. So for instance, if you look at one of the two photons unheralded, uh, if you have only one mode, the statistics should be thermal, meaning, meaning that if a zero time uh, second order autocorrelation measurement is done, then we should find a value of two. And the shape of this is uh, uh, informing us about the uh, spectral characteristics of the photons that are there. So the maximum value of is two. So in this paper, the value that was obtained is, is very close to two. It's a very uh, tiny peak and to actually see a feature going that high, you need the excellent uh, jitter statistics 
of or the, the, the excellent jitter um, or time resolution of the SNS readings. So a good result obtained there, which was further improved afterwards. And then another thing to look at the entanglement, you need to have a very large SNR, so low noise. So if, when you look at these entanglement fridges, you have a, a high value there, but most importantly, a very low value there in order to show that the entanglement is, is there. So this is what was done in that experiment. There. So uh, quantum simulation and computing, naturally there, if one needs to have a lot of detectors with high efficiency, very important to do these multi-photon experiments and low DCR, then the SNSPDs is the technology of toys. I can have this low jitter, large number of, of uh, detectors and so on. If you combine all of this, then you have a great tool to uh, tackle this problem there. So I'm not gonna talk about this in details, but if you're interested, We'll be happy to discuss afterwards. Uh, and by the way, we also offer rack solutions where we can put these devices into a rack that uh, can be moved from one lab to the other uh, or that are suited for uh, welcoming a, a large number of optical fibers and have the processing all done inside with a time controller. Okay, now let me move to a um, uh, highly industrial application. So this is a project we've been doing in collaboration with the uh, Ariane Group, Ariane's, uh, Ariane Space, uh, more precisely. And uh, the context is the following. So the uh, Ariane Space uh, or the European Space Agency uh, has its own launcher program. It's the Ariane program. And the Ariane 5 program is coming to an end, currently being replaced or soon to be replaced with Ariane 6. And this, has, uh, this program has a lot of uh, requirements. And one of them is unsurprisingly to uh, reduce the cost. That's because as you know, there's lots of competition in the space sector uh, these days. And then uh, one of the things that uh, Ariane wanted to do here was to introduce optopyrotechnics. So in the launching sequence of this launcher, you have to first ignite the boosters, the, the engines, and you have to separate the boosters, you have to separate the different stages, get rid of the fairing, and then drop the payload. So this is done by igniting uh, the, uh, charges that remove the mechanical holders that hold all of these together. And this was uh, originally done with electropyrotechnics, which is quite susceptible to the electromagnetic environment surrounding this. And this was this is this was creating actually a lot of problems in the in safety, or this could be creating problems in safety, uh, or uh, and also was uh, not the most cost-effective uh, solution. So what they wanted to do was to replace all of this with optopyrotechnics, where an optical pulse is detonating the charge. So therefore, in that situation, you're not influenced by all the polluted electromagnetic magnetic environment that you find uh, around. The, the the places where all the different stages are assembled or or yeah, uh, brought together and then assembled in a, uh, uh, at the final uh, launching pad in cool so in order to um, uh, to inspect uh, all this optical fiber that is that needs to be put in there you need to have an OTDR with extreme requirements more precisely a a, a very good spatial resolution in a large core MMF fiber 1.5 centimeters you need to have something that does a short production production test with the free running detection of up to eight kilometer of fiber in the launcher. So lots of the fibers to check. And then it needs to be able to do insertion on insertion loss measurements. So we worked together with Ariane Space and actually came up to the conclusion that this was possible only with SNSPDs. So what we made is a bunch of uh, boxes like this that are used in different places in Europe and also in, uh, in, in Kourou, where this is launched, uh, to inspect the optical fibers. And we combine the SNSPD ID281 uh, with the time controller into the system in order to, to do that. So what we end up with is a device that is uh, more typically used in research labs, but uh, here it's a, a very industrial application. And actually what we do with this device is we have the possibility of, of generating automatic report generation. So for instance, we connect a lot of optical fibers to the device and the device is going to test these devices and it's going to generate a, uh, a report that has either a test passed or test failed. 
So uh, in, in this way, we can uh, reduce the human interaction required and we get the, a high reliability. And the device is going to be looking at these different peaks obtained by the system. And if there is a foreign peak, for instance, here, it's going to create a, a failed device, a failed test. So it's very nice to see that superconductivity, a device, uh, cooling down uh, uh, a nanowire at 0 0.8 Kelvin is used in such a uh, industrial application. It's a ground equipment, it's not sent to space, it still is on the ground, but nevertheless, in order to achieve this, you need uh, uh, very high reliability combined with the best performance in order to achieve something that has a big impact in, in this program there. And actually the device is going to be used as one of the, the green lights uh, before launching. So uh so it's going to be be playing an important role when this is going to be launched uh right now the first launch is planned for 2022. okay let me move on to another very interesting application ic inspection uh, that can be done with the cube and the time controller and this work was actually done by collaborators at dlr so we thank them very much for uh sharing this information uh what they want to do here is to look at a, a, an IC, for instance, this uh, FPGA there, and look at the really intimate details of what's going on in there, just to make sure, for instance, that the, 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 um, the design is as intended, so everything is firing up, firing up as it should, or also possibly to detect any, um, anything that was done in a manner that was not intended for good or bad reasons. And this is possible using different techniques. And one of the techniques is, is to fire up, well, it is to send electrical signals through that and look at the different parts using a microscope objective. And actually when an electrical signal goes through certain parts, certain transistors in, in this device, it's going to generate uh, very faint uh, single photon uh, level signals. So if we look at it and we put a SPAD and we time correlate the time uh, where the signal is propagating through that and where we have the detection as a function of position, we can uh, look at what's going on uh, more precisely in there and we can actually reveal defects. So this is possible only because we have the, the ability to have very low jitter detection and the time correlation there. So for this, free running detectors are best suited. And they have generated this video there, very fascinating video, where they have looked at this device here. And first they have looked at it with a uh, CCD camera. And if you expose it, uh, you create a still image of the different parts that are being activated whenever you have uh, the signal propagating. But then if you look at it with time correlated single photon detection, as the electrical signal propagates through the chip, you're gonna see different parts lighting up one after the other. And if you look at the time scale here, it's uh, very short. So you see like nanosecond and picosecond time scale. So you build this image through time and you see those signals coming through and you can actually verify that everything is operating as it should be. So again, fascinating, uh, fascinating image there. Uh, thanks again to the DLR people for uh, uh, sharing this, uh, this material here. Okay, so another application, very interesting one, it's, is singlet oxygen detection. Uh, so singlet oxygen is something that can be produced by certain, uh, certain materials. It, it's, it can be used in photodynamic therapy to treat cancer for, for, uh, among, uh, for several uh, among several reasons. And then uh, the idea there is to use, uh, again, something like the cube and the time controller to do time correlated single photon detection in order to see the presence of singlet oxygen. So this is done by uh, applying a, uh, an excitation pulse onto a sample, and then we collect fluorescence and we time correlate this laser pulse with the detection here, we can build the histogram. So in this paper here, 2015, uh, we see that the fluorescence of rose bengal, which is a dye, is clearly seen when we have the excitation pulse. So here we have, after excitation, a kind of buildup of the fluorescence and then uh, of the luminescence, and then we have this decay there. And interestingly, this, uh, the presence of that is also telling us something about 
its surroundings, because actually, if you put this sodium azide here, NaN3, you can quench this uh, transfer of the excitation pulse energy to the luminescence, okay? And if you have this here, you're going to see only the excitation pulse and this luminescence is completely quenched. So you can know about, you can learn something about the surroundings of the, uh, the, the dye here or uh, whatever you're using in uh, the, uh, the uh, process that you're looking at. Here's another example. I'm not gonna go into the details, but we have here a very clean exponentially decaying curve there uh, that, uh, that, is, that can be obtained by using the advanced processing feature input output of the time controller around um, along with the free running uh, detector there. And, and by the way, uh, since SNSPDs detect beyond 1550, this really is opening um, some some uh, some room for uh, doing fluorescence in the in, in the spectral region up to two microns or even more with with that. So if you are if this, second, this is the kind of thing that you're looking at, please contact us. We'll be happy to discuss that with you. Okay, let me talk now about lidar. So lidar, as you know, is is used for uh, autonomous vehicle. It's also used for security in perimeter, perimeter sur surveillance, where we want to make sure that, for instance, a, a certain site uh, that needs to be uh, where nobody should be going through for security reasons, we can use LIDAR to detect any movement there. So uh, we've worked on a project uh, at 1550 uh, to make a LIDAR where we have the ID900 triggering a pulse laser, which generates uh, single, uh, which generates uh, pulses of light, and then light can hit the hard target, a signal can come back, and here by putting an array of detectors, we can do correlations between these different detectors. And that's very interesting because it actually allows increasing the signal to noise ratio. And here's how it works. Uh, if there is, um, if a light hits a hard target, we uh, can be in a regime where we're going to have a lot of photons still coming through. It's still a, a faint signal, but we have uh, maybe 10 photons coming back. And therefore, if we have 10 photons, we have a higher probability of having more than one detector clicking here in this array there. And that's interesting because if it comes from a hard target, then a, a lot of detectors clicking simultaneously will have a non-negligible a probability, a good one. However, the background light is evenly distributed in time or randomly distributed in time. And therefore that leads to a background detection that has a very low probability of generating a high peak there. So if you put a threshold at a certain level, we can be sure that we only keep these elements there. So something that diffuses light or that is background light will be below this threshold there. So we can improve the SNR there. And, and there's one thing that we did. So we did a rapid prototyping using the time controller and the cube uh, in order to uh, do some LIDAR. And for instance, here is, is an example where we've tested this uh, in a foggy situation where the reflection can be diffused. And by doing this, we've been able to see a three at the right distance through uh, the fog there. So uh, thanks to this correlation technique. We have used this in, in collaboration with SK Telecom to put this into a small system here with the ID Cube OEM version inside, along with the scanning. And this was this was demoed at uh, CES um, 2019 and 2020. Okay, so with this, I'm getting to the end of what I wanted to tell you about today. So let's just go over quickly over the why and the how. So why? Well, going beyond the classical limits and conventional techniques, I, I spoke about QKD entanglement, very good examples of that. Uh, highest sensitivity or faster measurements, this is this can be obtained with OTDR, fluorescence measurement, also gas imaging, but I didn't talk about this today, but this is an example where we can get faster measurements. Uh, better spatial and time resolution, well, we can get this with IC inspection, OTDR, LIDAR and range finders uh, using single photon detection techniques, improved SNR and see-through correlations. That's what I just spoke about using LIDAR. And then iSafe requirements. This is uh, uh, most often necessary for uh, LIDAR and range finders. How do we do this? Well, with the right, uh, the, uh, the right uh, hardware and the right software and the right uh, techniques. And in this way, you can get the best performance and user experience. And this allows you to do the best science 
that you can do. Okay, so uh, uh, we have a bunch of uh, webinars covering different topics and more details on our website. So please do not hesitate to go there and have a look at those. Uh, uh, on behalf of IDQ, I really want to say thank you for spending this time with us. I want to say thank you to all of our collaborators and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Now I'll be happy to take some questions. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Felix, for, for the great presentation and, and, and this uh, new webinar. Um, we've, got, we've got a few questions. Uh, please use the uh, question box to write your questions, and we'll take questions one after the other. Um, let me ask you the first question, Felix. The first one is, is a, somebody is asking what is the, the required timing accuracy for SNSPD detectors, uh, and is it different from other uh, SPAD detectors? So uh, yes, let me um, move to this slide uh, here. Okay, so the SNSPDs, the jitter can be really low. Okay, it's typically at 50 picoseconds or lower than that. Um, so this is what we offer. Uh, if you compare to the SPADs, the SPADs will be as low as 50 picoseconds, but typically larger than this, uh, typically 100, maybe a bit more than that. It also depends on the bias voltage. Uh, there's a trade-off with uh, the noise, but there is no such trade-off with SNSPDs. So there uh, you will, uh, you can be in a region where you have the highest, the highest efficiency this is also where you're going to get the uh, the best jitter which can be as low as uh, 20 30 picoseconds uh, but typically 50 picoseconds or, or less okay Th thanks for that so the, the there's somebody asking what is the ultimate uh, timing accuracy uh, or or slash precision with, with an SSPD so uh, as research let's say research as SNSPDs made especially for um, for lowering the jitter, uh, were able to show a jitter as low as 2.7 picoseconds uh, at 532 nanometers. But this is not a detector that is, that has a high efficiency. So uh, you're gonna get uh, you're gonna get this only with a very very low detection efficiency. Now with a device where you want to have a high efficiency, you're not gonna be able to go as low as this, but this is going to be uh, again in the, the tens of picoseconds, the, uh, the best jitter you're gonna get there. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question is about LiDAR. Uh, so how, uh, how, how would you compare a, a single photon LiDAR to a classical uh, LiDAR, you know, in terms of operation and advantages? So a single photon LiDAR uh, will uh, typically give you a better time resolution if you have a, a single, uh, if you have a good uh, single photon detector with a good time resolution. So that, that's really one, one advantage uh, that you have there. You don't suffer for, from the um, you don't suffer from the uh, analog effects that you're going to see with a an APD that detects a, a, a pulse that has a lot of, of photons. So, so here because you're detecting only one single photon, uh, the only limit is really the uh, the time resolution of the detector. Now the difference is 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 uh, in some situation. Uh, the um, the dynamic range. What you're going to get with an SNSPD is when the signal is too strong, you're going to get a saturation of the detector. So if you need to be looking at a, a very long distance, you may have to cut uh, the distance into, or you cut the whole thing into uh, different sections so that you may be saturated here, but you're not saturated there. But, uh, but otherwise, uh, they will provide you with the a very good uh, time resolution, and in some situation, you're not going to get a uh, you're going to get a, a reduced uh, dead zone after a detection. So that that becomes a bit technical. 
Uh, if you're interested, please contact us. We can refer you to some publications regarding this. But I would say that these are the main two, uh, the, the two main advantages, time resolution and a reduction of the, the dead zone that you're going to get uh, in some situations. Right. Uh, there's, there's a couple of questions on, uh, on, the, on the SNSPD again. And this is about the, uh, the, the, the PNR capability of the uh, of of the detectors and how can uh, can we you know what kind of benefits do we get from that and the additional question to that is can it be used as a multi-pixel detector okay so uh the uh the benefit of the snspd uh, of the pnr detector is going to be uh okay so 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 what you get there okay just as a practical benefit, this device allows you to get to get you one of these uh, signals there, uh, one, two, three, or four clicks with only one coaxial line. Okay, so you don't need to, in terms of having a lot of detectors, say in one cryostat, this will use only one spot instead of having, let's say, four detectors that uses four spots into your detector. So in terms of cost effectiveness, this is clearly a more cost-effective solution than actually four detectors because you have only one coaxial line at the output. The, uh, and then uh, in terms of doing science with them, you will find solution, situations like, for instance, LIDAR, where it's going to be useful to be able to distinguish between this one and this one because this one may be coming from background light and this one may be coming from an actual uh, hard target. So, so you, can, you can use this here uh, again, with just a, a single uh, spot in the cryostat, not just a, an array of detectors and many analysis lines behind and, and all the processing. Uh, now, in terms of doing really advanced quantum optics, uh, most likely you need to be able to reach 95% uh, or higher uh, detection efficiency for, for this to become, to have a, 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 a you know, a, a huge advantage over a non-PNR detectors. And that's something we're working on. So please stay tuned for, for this information uh, here. Right. Am I missing, um, am I, am I missing something in a question, Mark? I, did, I, uh, did I answer everything? No, I think, I think you did answer. If, so, if, you, if you think the answer was not answered properly, please um, write again in the, in the dialogue box. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to... Um, elaborate more the, the question, but I think you you answered uh, the question. Uh, we're still getting a lot of questions. We're not going to be able to take all the questions. I'm sorry for that. So, but we will answer offline all these questions. Be be reassured that we, we're going to do that. But we're not. May, we may not be able to take all the questions. There's uh, there's more questions on the SNSPD uh, systems actually. Uh, maybe a couple more. So the first one is about the polarization sensitivity of the detectors. Can you elaborate more on that and how do we deal with it? So all SNSPDs based on, uh, let me show you, based on a meander like this one has, they have polarization sensitivity because they are linear. So the absorption in this direction is greater than the one in that direction. So in order to deal with this, uh, you uh, need to control polarization. So typically in an optics lab, you have the fiber uh, on the optical table fixed. Uh, and then uh, by using polarization paddles and your, your input signal stable, you can adjust and look at uh, the amount of detections you get, and you can rather easily optimize this. And if everything is, is kept stable, it's not going to move very quickly. So you may have to readjust after maybe a day or maybe half a day, really depending on, on how precise you want, to, you want to be there. But that's something that is dealt with by essentially every SNSPD user. So it's not a, something that prevents to get the best uh, the best performance out of out of that, and and the difference between the max and polarization that depends on the on the detector depends on the wavelength, uh, a few tens of percent between the max and the min is what you're going to get. Now this being said, it is possible to make SNSPDs that are uh, polarization insensitive in their efficiency, so you don't need to use you need to use something else in that, but actually need to use a spiral design, a double spiral design. That's also something we do. Uh, 
So we typically offer uh, uh, overall efficiency uh, above 70% uh, for these detectors. And this is actually indeed what we had to use for, uh, for the Ariane Space Launcher, because there, when you do OTDR, polarization changes as a function of where it's reflected. And in order to have a clean trace, you need to have polarization and sensitivity in the detector. And that's what we've been using in this, in this application uh, right there. So, so they do exist, we do sell them. Please contact us for, for more details. Uh, excellent. There's one. Well, let, let, let's take one more question then. This is about the um, Ariane uh, 6 program. Somebody is asking the questions about the, the, the safety. Uh, you know, what, what have we done to guarantee that the system is safe and there's no risk of ignition uh, while we're taking measurements? And I think that's a yes, very good yes. question. <laughs> well, but this, this, uh, yeah, Abby, I, I mean, this is what. There's many reasons why we need to do this, do this with SNSPDs, but one of them uh, is that uh, the light injected in the fiber under test, which which ends with this uh, detonation charge, uh, needs to be very very faint in order to not damage the charge. Because one of the problems is to is to damage the charge, not necessarily to ignite it, although this is a possibility. But uh, you need to make sure that it's not uh, damaged uh, either, so that when you do need to ignite it, it will ignite properly. So in any case, uh, uh, one of the requirements is to be able to operate at a single photon level. And this is why you need to have a single photon OTDR. So that, that's one of the reasons that that's one of the things that, uh, 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 that, that make it safe. Uh, also, of course, everything else in the system, especially the laser itself, needs to be uh, safe and there's there's a, lot, a, a large analysis done behind to make to prove that this laser is is safe for operation in in this uh, in this application great thank you very much Felix and um, I think we're going to end uh, here this session uh, again if you have other questions we're going to take the other questions separately and we'll, we're going to answer all these questions separately. Uh, thank you for uh, for attending this webinar. And again, if you have other questions or looking for more information, please uh, come to uh, to see our website at www.idquantic.com. We'll be happy to uh, answer questions or, or connect with you at a later time. So thank you again, Felix, and uh, stay okay. tuned for more webinars. We're, we're looking at adding uh, new topics and new webinars. And I'm taking this opportunity also to ask you uh, if you have ideas or if you'd like to see some topics that you'd like us to cover, please don't hesitate to contact us and we'll be happy to, to prepare a, a webinar uh, on that specific topics. So thanks again and uh, stay safe and healthy. Uh, thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>